all are, and I'm so proud to bring you our next guest. Gene Roddenberry had a vision for the future, for space exploration, that culminated in a TV series in the 60s. You might have heard of it called Star Trek. That series continued on, that tradition of space exploration. In Star Trek, the next generation. My honor to bring to this stage Counselor Deanna Troy, Marina Sirtis. Hi! Thank you, Glenn. Thank you, Glenn. Yeah, I said, I hope he doesn't mind that I don't want a moderator. Because, you know. Hey! I thought you were all in Stan Lee's line. Because I've never seen such a long line in my life. God, he's amazing, isn't he? What is he, like 120? I swear to God, every time I do a con and he's there, he finds an excuse to touch me. Which is awesome, because he lives 120 years old. He's still, obviously, going strong there. He's married to an English woman, so he's a very smart man. So, thank you all for coming today um, and this weekend. Um, have I ever done this convention before? No? Oh, okay. It didn't look familiar. Because I, I have to be honest, they, have, they blend now. I mean, I never know what a convention is called. I just know which city I was in. I know I've been to Seattle before, so I couldn't remember if I'd done this convention before. So, being as I haven't done Emerald City before, I have to wait. Can you see out my dress from there? <laughs> Are you sure? Okay, great, thank you. Um, who has never seen me before? <laughs> Good Lord. That's a lot of people considering I am the convention queen. <laughs> so, where have y'all... I'm not in the South. Where have you all been for the last 27 years? Actually, some of you weren't born yet. Yeah, I know. All right, okay. <laughs> Yes, I know some of you weren't born yet. Well, for those of you who don't know and have any money to spare, ha ha, that's a joke, right? After coming to a convention for a weekend. Uh, it's my birthday tomorrow. So, this is how much I love my fans. I am spending, I am spending my 60th birthday with you. my brain in. Because if I was in England, I'd be getting my free bus pass now for free, free public transportation. <laughs> you don't know about that because nothing's free in this country. Okay. <laughs> Including healthcare, don't get me started. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm just going to be political for one second. Healthcare is a right, not a privilege for the rich. That's all I have to say. because she's in her wedding frock. So she's obviously late for church. Oh no, you're a zombie bride. You're a zombie bride. Okay. I know nothing about zombies. I don't. In fact, I don't really know much about sci-fi at all. Um, I know I was in Star Trek, but that was just a great job. Um, Brent Spiner always says that I only like movies that people Spiner. die of an incurable disease. Brent Spiner data. So Steel Magnolias is my favourite movie Brent of the last 20 years. <laughs> yes. what you're about. Yeah, laughter through tears is my favourite emotion. Yes. <laughs> so, Zombie Bride, what would you like to know? Um, well, first I'd like to say um, Star Trek Next Generation aired when I was in high school and it was something I watched and I just loved you. You're one of the sort of few women on TV at the time that was really strong and so vulnerable and, and wonderful. And you're so beautiful then, and oh. you're still so beautiful now. Well, you've got to say that. Because you know. <laughs> as a few of you know, I will strike you. If, you. if you piss me off, I will hit you. I've hit a couple of guys. Are you in the audience today? Right. I don't care. Right. Um, but thank you, my dear. That's 
Sorry, sweetie, yeah. So I do have a question. My question is, on Star Trek Next Generation, you had a special relationship <coughs> with Miguel Roddenberry, yeah. who was, you know, key and integral to the entire Star Trek franchise. She had, you know, influence on everything from her voice on the computer. Yeah. Um, what was it like to work with her, and did you have, did that special relationship um, expand beyond just the character? Okay. <coughs> So bear in mind that I I booked I came to America for three months. <coughs> Twenty seven years later, I'm still here <laughs> uh, because I got that great job. And um, we basically laughed for seven years on the set. We're the only cast, and I know I'm not telling you anything you don't know. We're the only cast where the whole cast genuinely adored each other. The other casts, well, you know. Anyway, um, <laughs> so we were having way too much fun. Uh, in fact, we had a director in the first season who directed two shows and then he refused to ever come back because we were too rowdy. <laughs> really, no, this is true. Um, so, Majel was showing up, for, actually The Haven was her first episode, and although it wasn't shown as the, third e as the third episode, I think we actually shot it as the third episode for a season. And we already were badly behaved. Um, but this was the boss's wife, right? So we, I think we all kind of went, we, we better be good. We just better be good for, you know, just for this episode until she's gone, you know. Um, and then she showed up on the set. And we realized within half a day, really, that she was nuttier than the rest of us put together. <laughs> and she fit right in, right? Actually, the wonderful thing about having Majel on the show was we saw Jean the most when Majel was there. She, he basically would come and sit on the side of the set and watch her adoringly. It was lovely. And so we, that was nice because we got to see way more of him. As far as my relationship with them was concerned, um, I really was an alien in America, you know, and I come the holidays, I didn't have anywhere to go, I didn't have any family here, and basically the Roddenberries adopted me. So yeah, they were like my surrogate mum and dad in America. Uh, my dad had already passed away, um, and so they kind of took me in. And I still call Rod bro, and he calls me sis. Um, in fact, when my own mum passed away, <coughs> I said to Majel, uh, I've made myself cry now. Um, I said to Majel, you've got to last much longer because you're the only mom I've got left now. And she didn't. So um, anyway, at my age, I really don't expect to still have parents, to be honest. Um, but we were, we were very close. And I take that, that was one of the biggest blessings of being involved in Star Trek, was that I was actually able to have a, like a, a relationship outside of Trek with the Roddenberry family. That's okay, you do. I, yeah, but I cry commercials, don't worry about that. Okay. <laughs> anyway, yeah, thanks for the cry. Okay, yes, dear. What well, was it like working with Sir Patrick Stewart? Oh, my, oh, for God's sake. <laughs> you know what? I wonder if anyone ever asks old Baldy. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> Uh, what it was like working with me. It's like, fuck you. <laughs> it was an ensemble cast. Right? And he wasn't a sir when we started. He was just an unknown Shakespearean actor. And I'm not making that up. One of, that was one of the reviews that he got. Unknown Shakespearean actor. So he cut it out of the paper, blew it up, and stuck it on his trailer door. Awesome. When we started, he was very serious. Like, I could just say, when that director refused to work with us, um, we were all called into Tasha's quarters, and we were all reamed by the principal that this was you know, unheard of in the history of Hollywood, that a director would refuse to work with actors um, because they were too rowdy, and what were we thinking, and you know. And Denise, bless her, she goes, well, you know, sometimes we're here 
for 18 hours a day. If we're not having fun, it's going to be terrible. And Sir Old Baldy goes, and where, Denise, does it say in our contract that we're here to have fun? <laughs> <laughs> well, you can imagine the earful he got from me. <laughs> Cut to 2015. He's the silliest one of all of us now. <laughs> <laughs> He's a very silly man, and we love him much more now than we did then. <laughs> Don't ask me what it was like to work with people. That is the most unimaginative question. Where'd you go? <laughs> I'm being filmed. It's going to be on the internet for all eternity. Right. Thank you. Yes, dear. Not, as you can see, I'm not as sweet as her. In fact, I'm more like Demona than Diana. Okay. Yes, dear. Hello. Hello. Um, I'm Marina. Really? Would you name after me? I was, in oh fact. Oh, my God. Come here, come here. No. <laughs> oh, no. No way. Oh, that's so cool. She, she, she gave her a hug. I don't care. Yes, my love. Hi. 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 I think you met my parents earlier. I did. They told me about you. Yes. Is it true that they told you to try to get, that you told them to try to convince me out of wanting to be an actress? Yes. Do you want to be an actress? I do, in fact. Can I talk you out of it? No. Then you can be an actress. <laughs> Yeah, because 
basically, there, are, there, is, there is actually, there are reasons that I wasn't in the space suit. Because basically, okay, when I was hired, I was about the size I am now. In Hollywood, that's obese. Honestly. Because they're like matchsticks with boobs and blonde hair. Right? I would say they're like matchsticks with the wood scraped off. And... Think about it. Okay. It'll sink in. Right. So when I was hired, they put me in a spacesuit and I was just... Because all my weight, when I gain weight, never makes it down to my legs. It only sits around my middle, right? And um, they went, oh, oh she looks dreadful. I mean, actually, when I got the job, they said, you got the job, lose five pounds. That was, that was what I heard on the phone. So they went, oh, blimey, what are we going to put her in? Well, the legs are good, right? Let's put her in the cosmic cheerleader outfit. <laughs> So that was why in Encounter at Farpoint, I was dressed as a Wendy's waitress in a very short skirt. Um, and that hair, actually, that exploded brillant pad on my head in that episode, that is my real hair. This is my hair ironed, right. So they put me in the cosmic cheerleader outfit and then they realised after the first episode that it didn't really suit the character, the personality of Troy to be like, dressed like a go-go dancer. Maybe I should be in a cage in Studio 54 somewhere, you know. You don't know, the young people don't know what I'm talking about. The older people do. So anyway, um, they decided that if I wasn't going to be wearing a space suit, I would have a costume, you know, something else to wear. So they took me to a colour specialist. There's three hours of my life I'll never get back. <laughs> sat there with this woman with swatches, you know, putting colours up to my face to see what suited me, and I end up in grey. <laughs> <laughs> the ugly grey space suit is what I called it. And there was a sash, remember that belt? Pink one and a green one, exactly where my fat was. I used to watch the show and think, you know, why don't they just have arrows pointing to it? <laughs> this is where she's fat, folks. <laughs> now, there are certain rules in Hollywood, not written down, but accepted as fact, that if a girl has, has a cleavage, she cannot have a brain. And originally, brain, uh, Troy was supposed to be the brains of the enterprise. I know, step back in amazement, I know. Um, so when she got a cleavage, the few grey cells she had all disappeared, and she became decorative, like a potted palm on the bridge. And then they thought, oh yeah, I, I wanted, and of course I was working out, because I got sick of, me and Jonathan were the two that heard it the most, you're fat, you're fat, you're fat, right? So I started working out much more, and eating less, and doing all the right stuff, and was getting thinner and thinner and so then they made me the red one and then they made me the lilac one and then they made me the green dress. I effing hated that dress <laughs> because I had to wear a corset underneath. Not because I was fat but because the fabric was so fine that it, well basically we're wrinkle free in the 24th century. <laughs> Which is why all the boys do the Picard manoeuvre. <laughs> right? That's awesome. <laughs> so it was a leopard with a skirt sewn on the top. So if I wanted to go to the loo, I had to get naked. <laughs> Don't. It was. It's horrible. And plus, it was all lopsided. And I'm very. I'm a very symmetrical person, and that bothered me a lot. Um, <laughs> So finally we get to, a, at like, I think it was season six, mm -hmm. and we're auditioning Captain Jellicoe in case Patrick wants too much money next season. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he says, go for the space suit. And guess what? She had one in her closet. Never seen it before. They never made me a space suit. They gave me one of the extra space suits. Oh, sorry, they're not called extras anymore. Atmosphere. One of the atmosphere space suits. 
everything's so PC down there. Anyway, um, and by then I was actually really skinny, and it looked good. And the producers were like, oh my god, she looks great in that. Why hasn't she been wearing that for the last six years and saved us thousands of dollars in costumes? <laughs> so, they wanted to like not keep me in the space suit, but I kind of insisted that I wanted to stay in the space suit. And so we, we met a compromise where when I was on duty, I'd be in the space suit. When I was off duty, I could be in one of my other frocks. So, because I lost my cleavage, guess what? Oh, my brain matter came flooding back, <laughs> as if by magic. <laughs> and suddenly, not only have I got brains, but I am the expert in Romulan technology. <laughs> so, we're on that spaceship. What was that episode called? Timescape or something? So, it's, uh, I'm on that Romulan spaceship, and I have this line, and I still remember the line, because it was, that's impossible. The Romulans use an artificial quantum singularity as their power source. <laughs> okay, I fess up, it took me three weeks to learn the line. It did, because I, I don't do techno battle. Um, but do you remember who I was saying it to? Geordie and Dana! <laughs> <laughs> I swear to God, they were standing on either side of me when we were shooting the scene, and I was taking like glances to my left and right to make sure they hadn't developed a cleavage while I wasn't looking. <laughs> <laughs> Tremendously, 
Um, she's a great role model, Deanna. Marina, not so much. Okay? <laughs> so, um, I think it would be great if people who were normal sized, average people, saw themselves on the screen, especially women, because they don't. Apart from Melissa McCarthy, God bless her, most women don't see themselves represented on television or in the movies, and I think that's pathetic, to be honest, and which shows that there are certain elements of Hollywood that are kind of still stuck in the 50s, which is, you know, for those younger ones, the last century. Um, <laughs> So, um, I think that when we're not as hung up about women being, you know, va va voom and just being about who they are, then I think we'd have conquered, we'd have done it right at the end. So, let's keep our fingers crossed. <laughs> I mean, it's interesting, you know, like I said, my hair's really curly. Um, I never realised at the time, you know, that you know, my having curly hair was an issue. Doing conventions, you don't know how many women have come up to me and said, you were the only person who looked like me on television. Right? Hey. That's important. That's really important, I think. And I think, you know, you all like mock us in England because we've got a royal family. You're desperate for a royal family, in my opinion. <laughs> You go bonkers over the weddings way more than we do in England. <laughs> Plus, you make your Hollywood movie stars into royalty. And they're just actors, right? So think about it. That's my counselling for the day. There you go. <laughs> yes, sir. What are you supposed to be? I'm a daredevil. You're a what? A daredevil. A daredevil. A daredevil. <laughs> it's, oh, I know nothing about comic books, Mother sorry. He did. Okay, sorry. But anyway, so I wanted to first off thank you for coming to the Boise DreamCon last year. I saw your panel and enjoyed it. Thank you. My question sort of got taken by I think I thought of two other ones. Um, so the first one is I would love to hear any stories or anything you have to say about the episodes of Voyager that you were on. Mm -hmm. And second, since he passed away, definitely be missed. Um, to get a work with Leonard Nimoy or in person. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, I actually, when they first called me to do Voyager, um, which was before I did it, I actually said no. I didn't want to do it. Then they called again, and before I could say no, they went, "You'll be working with white shorts." <laughs> and I went, "Okay." <laughs> <laughs> I love Dwight, as yeah, long as we don't talk you. politics, because he's just right of Attila the Hun. Um, I'd have to show you, I need to remember him. So I love Dwight, so I said, okay, I work with Dwight. And he is actually the only reason that I did Voyager. Consequently, I became really good friends with Bob Picardo, because there were a lot of scenes with him, and so we're really good friends now, and that, I'm glad I did it for that reason. As for Leonard, um, I knew him. I, we weren't friends. I didn't know him well enough to call him a friend. He was an acquaintance. Um, I was sad that he died, obviously, because it's sad when anybody goes. But he was 83. I should live so long, you know. I don't get really sad when old people die. You didn't have any scenes of them on the no. two parts? No, I was hardly in that effing episode. 